Hey, welcome to Mineral Talks Live, the weekly live webinar that brings you in-depth and in-person interviews with the mineral people from around the world. Mineral Talks Live is brought to you by a joint effort among the Mineralogical and Geological Museum at Harvard University, the Society of Mineral Museum Professionals, and Blue Cap Productions. Tune in every Wednesday and stay connected to your mineral world. Now, broadcasting live from beautiful Honolulu, Hawaii, the land of aloha, ukuleles, and shakas, this is Mineral Talks Live. Hello and welcome to another episode of Mineral Talks Live. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Brian Swoboda, president of Blue Cap Productions, and we've got a great show for you today. For those of you who are tuning into our program for the first time, Mineral Talks Live is a weekly webinar put on by myself representing Blue Cap Productions, Dr. Raquel Alonso Perez representing the Mineralogical and Geological Museum at Harvard University, and Dr. Eloise Gayou representing the Society of Mineral Museum Professionals, also known as the SMMP. And I apologize, I always, I always trip a little bit when I, when I say the name of the organization. But this program came about as a result of a conversation uh, Raquel Eloise and I had not too long ago. We were talking about COVID-19 and the effects it was having on our community. We knew that many of us were feeling a deep sense of isolation, especially in light of some of the mineral shows being canceled, and we felt we needed to do something about it. We thought that if we could pool our resources, we might be able to generate some interest in people watching a series of broadcasts featuring mineral people just talking and sharing stories. Now, Raquel and Eloise, they wanted to do it live, and well, after a little bit of convincing, I agreed, and that was the start of Mineral Talks Live. By combining our efforts and contacts, Raquel, Eloise, and I knew that we'd be presenting a show with true international feel, and with me broadcasting from Honolulu, Hawaii, Raquel broadcasting from Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Eloise from various locations in France, our international guest list would reflect our own backgrounds. Now, these guests will include people from all walks of the mineral community throughout the programs. I'll be conducting the interviews while Raquel and Eloise will be doing the genius, they're actually the geniuses, doing all the serious behind the scenes work that really makes the show possible. And you as a viewer, we're inviting you to be a part of the show and participate via the chat and the Q&A windows located at the bottom of your screen. Now, the chat feature allows you to type messages to everyone watching and participating in the show. If you do nothing else, at least sign in and say hi to everyone and tell us where you're from. During the show, our guests and I will be focused on our conversation and not really looking at the chat windows. However, both Raquel and Eloise and Caroline in this, in, in this episode, because uh, uh, Raquel is actually on vacation, but they'll be very active in those chats. So look for their comments along with everyone else's. And at times, either uh, Eloise or, or Caroline will interject during the interview with questions that you're asking. So there's certainly an interactive aspect to this program. So again, we invite you to get involved. Now, the Q&A function also allows you to get involved by submitting general questions that we'll try to answer at the end of the interviews. Finally, at about 40 minutes into the program, you may see a window pop up on your screen asking a bunch of questions for our weekly poll. This is just a bit of fun where you can try to predict how our guests will answer these 10 questions. And I'm going to ask these same questions of our guests at the end of the show. It's a bit of fun and you may get to know our guests a little bit better. At the end of this, we usually have some kind of prize and today's prize is really special. Our guest today offered a free x-ray diffraction analysis and mineral identification for our winner today. So hang out to the end of the program. We'll give you all the information you need uh, on how you can win today's prize. Now, as for today's guest, I'm really happy to welcome Dr. John Rakovan to the show. John has been collecting for over 40 years and is a fellow of the Mineralogical Society of America. John is also the executive editor or one of the executive editors and a frequent contributor to Rocks and Minerals magazine, one of the great American mineral magazines. In addition to this, John is also the most recent recipient of the Carnegie Mineralogical Award, and he's the professor and director of graduate studies at Miami University, where he's joining us right now. John, how are you doing today? Brian, thank you very much. Raquel, Eloise, thank you all for having me here today. It, it's wonderful. As I was telling you earlier, we were we started outside. We were listening to the waves here on the beach in Miami, and um, it's just a beautiful day. But I wish we were in Miami. We're actually in Miami, Ohio. We're about 2,000 miles away from Miami Beach in Florida. 
Well, now I hear that Disney is going to be opening a new uh, Epcot Center there in Ohio near Miami. Is that correct? Or is that uh, just rumors? Yeah, there's a little town next door called um, uh, College Corner. And I think that's Disney's site for the next Epcot Center. Yes. <laughs> a population of about 50. <laughs> <laughs> So, John, um, you and I first met uh, years ago. I think um, it was probably somewhere around um, 2008, 2009, and you wrote a review of one of the first um, What's Hot in Tucson's in Rocks and Minerals uh, magazine. Um, I never, you know, so that's part of our history, but I never really asked you, or got to know what got you into mineral research. Can you kind of give us a little background there and uh, bring us up to speed a little bit? Sure. So um, like many of the viewers today, I got into the science of mineralogy through collecting. So as you mentioned, I've been collecting for more than 40 years and I had some really important mentors in my life, a, a gentleman named Sal Avella from Apple Valley Minerals in, in Rhode Island. Uh, was one of those. And growing up, I was surrounded by people in the mineralogical community. Carl Francis was a good friend from a very early age. Um, I knew people in the community, and I realized I wanted to study mineralogy. I wanted to learn about it. But because of those connections, I also realized that studying mineralogy wasn't just taking a class, it was doing it. It was doing research. And so when I got the opportunity to, to go to college, I looked very seriously for places where I could get involved in it. However, I, I really didn't have a lot of guidance in terms of where to go at that time. I knew I, what I wanted, but I didn't know exactly where. And I actually jumped around to a couple different universities until I found out found a place that really had what I wanted. That, that was the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. And mm -hmm. I arrived, introduced myself, said that I wanted to do research in mineralogy, and I was introduced to uh, Professor Jim Kirkpatrick. And Jim hired me on the spot and said, we'll give you a desk in my laboratory and you can start tomorrow. And that was my first true experience in, in mineralogical research. And how did you end up over at uh, Miami University from there? Well, that was a, a convoluted route. I, I finished my <laughs> undergraduate, went and did a master's, did a PhD, did a <laughs> postdoc. I spent a lot of time in school, but that's wonderful because all I really wanted to do was study minerals and the whole, the whole trip was, was allowing me to do that. And when I finished my postdoc, um, like anybody who I think is smart is going to apply for everything that's available. So I looked for industry jobs, I looked for teaching jobs, et cetera. I had not been to Miami. In fact, I hadn't heard of the university until um, it was my senior year as a grad, as a PhD student, my last year as a PhD student, there was a workshop that was held by the Mineralogical Society of America here at Miami University. It was on transmission electron microscopy. And I came to that workshop and I was introduced to the school and I absolutely fell in love. I thought that would be the place to work. But there was a gentleman here, his name is John Hughes. He's a great friend and colleague now. And he's a mineralogist. I thought, there's no way they're going to hire me. They already have a mineralogist. Well, you see what happens. So John and I overlapped a little bit. He's now at the University of Vermont. He left here to become provost there. But it was that trip and that connection and just um, very, very good fortune on my part that I was able to come to Miami. Well, that's fantastic. And it sounds like that was a very early influence that the MSA had uh, on you. And we'll get into that a little bit later. Tell me right now uh, what, you're, what you're working on, what you've been researching. So we're, by the way, we're broadcasting from one of the laboratories here. This is behind me is a powder x-ray diffractometer. And I'm going to show you in a little bit what we do with that and how it operates. But in terms of the research that, that we're doing, there's several projects that I'm involved with um, in terms of graduate schools. So Miami University, the Department of Geology and Environmental Earth Science has undergraduate degrees, masters and PhD. And uh, I'm advising students at all of those levels. And I've got several PhD students that are working on projects, including the nature and the mechanism of formation 
of wire silver and wire gold. And a spin-off project from that is something that uh, I've been collaborating with Raquel on and her colleague and my colleague as well, Frank Koich, also from Harvard. And we had the opportunity to study um, very recently and we're working on um, putting that out, the Harvard, the Groundhog Mine uh, wire gold from uh, Colorado, which is considered the finest wire gold in existence and one of the finest mineral specimens. And Brian, I see that you brought up the, the photograph here. This is an aerial view of the Neutron Science Center at Los Alamos National Laboratory. And th this project looking at wire silver and wire gold, and particularly the, the Harvard groundhog specimen. And this is where you've been doing the majority of that research. Exactly. Um, go oh, there's the a picture image. of us yep, loading up the sample. That's the sample holder, if you can believe it. <laughs> That's incredible. And then that right there is image we're very familiar with. There's the, there's the Harvard wire gold in the, um, in the sample cage. So we went to Los Alamos to do this because um, obviously we don't want to destroy or, or damage this specimen. And what neutrons allow us to do is see inside of that. We can probe the entire volume of that crystal, both structurally, we can look at its texture and crystal structure, and also chemically. Is it gold? Is it an alloy of gold, et cetera? And so it was a fantastic opportunity to take that specimen and work on it. That is fantastic. And uh, are the results uh, from that finished or are you still uh, um, compiling or what, what's the status of that? There's, there's a little more uh, data analysis that we're doing, but I can, we've published some of the results certainly. And I can tell you if you're interested a little bit about what we found. Absolutely. I mean, this is such an iconic piece, and yeah. uh, obviously it has such strong ties to uh, Harvard University, which is uh, one of our um, co-partners in this whole affair. So yeah, if you can briefly share uh, some some results on that, it'd be wonderful. Sure, absolutely. And um, so one of the questions, you look at that, and we knew it was gold, but that's all, of, all we knew. The, the morphology is that of a wire, like a wire silver. Uh, is that a single crystal? Is it polycrystalline? Is it made up of many, many fibrous crystals? Is it made up of many equant crystals, more, more like a texture of a granite? Mm -hmm. It turns out that our recent studies on silver wires tell us that the famous wires from Kongsberg, Norway, or Freiburg, Germany are polycrystalline, but unsuspected, they are not many fibrous crystals, they are more like a granite. So the individual crystals in a wire are more equant than they are elongate. Now they're slightly elongate, but not uh, highly. The morphology of that gold is so much like a wire silver, we anticipated the same thing and the result was very different. That gold wire is much more like a single crystal than it is a polycrystalline aggregate. And that is totally surprising. Another thing that we learned is that, um, now we had an inkling of this from analyses that Raquel and Frank did at Harvard. They used a technique called EDS and it allows you to measure chemistry, but because the gold is so dense, the chemistry that they measured was only on the surface. And what they saw is that there was some silver in there, about 25% silver, 75% gold. Of course, we didn't know what the interior was like and Normally what you would do is you'd slice that thing in half to look at the interior. Of course, you don't want to do that with that specimen. So that's another reason we use the neutrons. We could actually get chemistry throughout the entire sample. And we found that the entire, crisp, the entire wire is actually a alloy of 75% gold, 25% silver. And one of my graduate students who's working on the silver wire project had hypothesized, and we're gathering more data on this. It looks like it may be the case that for wire gold to form, we think that there might, it might be necessary that there's appreciable silver that goes along with the gold. Interesting. And so the way that it forms, is that a, a function more of uh, the gold itself, the native element, or the environment in which it was grown? 
So in the context of the gold, Brian, we really don't know. We have a hypothesis based on the silver studies that we've done, uh, but gold is somewhat enigmatic in terms of how exactly the gold wires are forming. It's something that we're working on. I can tell you that with the gold, the silver wires, however, it's absolutely dependent on the environment. And the environment is actually something that you would not expect. It's not growing from a solution, even though they're growing in hydrothermal environments, the growth is a solid state process. And it involves the conduction of silver atoms or ions through silver sulfide, the mineral acanthite or a high temperature argentite. Uh -huh. So it's a, it's a very, very different sort of environment or scenario than most people would expect in terms of crystal growth processes. And it's one of the things that makes it very fascinating. Well, I absolutely love that because gold has been such a, uh, a big part of our, um, our the culture of our species. It's been around for so long. It's been written about so much, and yet we're still learning new things about it all the time. Yeah. Yes. And like I said, in the context of the, um, the Harvard gold from the groundhog mine in Colorado, we have a hypothesis, but that's all it is at this point. We really don't have good data in terms of how exactly did that thing form. Well, fascinating. Now, I know that you're also involved with a project in Chicago, and let me pull up that photo there. Why don't you tell us a little bit about this? All right, so another, the facilities that you're showing are national facilities like Los Alamos National Laboratory. This is the advanced photon source at Argonne National Laboratories in Chicago and just outside of Chicago. And what you're looking at is the building that houses the particle accelerator. That particle accelerator um, accelerates electrons around a ring that's in that ring shaped building very close to the speed of light. And when they do that, those electrons give off energy in the form of x-rays. And so that's a just a giant x-ray source like the x-ray diffractometer behind me here. So in the meantime that Brian is, um, is playing his little music there, I have a few questions already for you, um, John. Um, Peter McGaw is asking, uh, you've synthesized silver wires, no luck on gold yet? <laughs> Very good question. Um, we actually haven't tried, and it turns out that people who have studied wire silvers in the past, there, there is one publication from the early 1900s where they tried to grow gold wires and they were unsuccessful. And now that we have a better idea of how silver wires form, we think we understand why they were unsuccessful. So Calvin Anderson, who's my PhD student, who's been doing most of the work on the wire silvers, he has a hypothesis for how we might be able to do it in the laboratory. And that is one of the things that we anticipate doing in the future. We just received, um, a large grant from the National Science Foundation of the United States uh, to continue our work on wire formation. And so one of the things we do plan to do is try to synthesize the wire gold. Now the purpose for that is not to produce specimens of wire gold per se, but to understand the process by which they form. Okay, and while I'm at it, Peter has another question for you. Any chance the silver is annealed and then recrystallized? I'm sorry, could you repeat that, Eloise? Yes, uh, any chance that the silver is annealed and then recrystallized? So in our experiments, we know that that is not the case. We, we grow things and analyze them immediately um, in a fashion that we know that they're not annealed. And what's interesting is that the textures, actually many aspects of, of the wire silvers that we grow in the laboratory, particularly the textures, um, look almost identical to what occurs in natural silvers. So the fact that we know that our synthetic silvers have not annealed, yet the natural silvers look just like them, we suspect that that's not the case in nature either. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, John. And I will um, let sure. Ryan continue the, um, the interview. And I'm going to look for, some people are asking for a picture, a nice picture of the gold uh, wire. So I will try to find that for you guys and share my screen a bit later on. I think Brian may have a picture of both the Harvard wire and one of our synthetic silver wires. 
Okay, well, if you can share that from your screen, if you have it there ready, otherwise I will try to look for it. No worries. I, I okay. think this is the synthetic uh, silver wire that you're talking about. It is, yes. So, so that's us. That's a, the end of a wire silver. We're, we're looking at that in an electron microscope, a scanning electron microscope, and you can see the typical striations. This looks very much like what you see with natural samples. But if you look really carefully, notice that I don't have a cursor to point this out, but notice the texture that is um, smaller in relief than the actual striations. You can actually see the grain boundaries of the individual silver crystals. Can you see them there? Very, is it, is it this area that we're, you're talking about? The whole thing is covered. So see the alligator skin on the surface? Yeah. Those, each one of those uh, scales in the alligator skin is a single silver crystal. Wow. So that's what I was saying before. The texture is unlike what we had expected. We expected that the striations reflected individual wire-like crystals, but that's not what we see at all. We see these individual smaller crystals that are more equant in their morphology that comprise the entire silver wire. The striations are just superimposed on that. Now, this was created in the lab, so you couldn't yes. use this technique to determine uh, natural silvers versus uh, man-made silver wires, could you? So one of the things that we're looking at, and it's, it's a, um, this is something that we're still working on, and so I don't have an answer at this moment, but we're looking at ways to determine if there are, um, whether or not a specimen has been grown na uh, in nature, a natural specimen or synthetic. And the fact that the textures, that texture that you just saw there is also what you see in natural samples. It appears that textural analysis is not the answer for discriminating natural versus synthetic. They look identical essentially. So there's variations, but um, within the variation in both naturals and synthetics, they're, they're pretty much the same. We're investigating um, chemistry and not just elemental chemistry, but isotope chemistry as a way to distinguish between the two. And that's something that um, we've published an article very recently in the journal Geology. Uh, in fact, that, that study made the cover of Geology in July of last year, just a year ago. And what we find is a very, very distinct difference in the silver isotope chemistry of the samples that we grew in our laboratory and samples that we know are natural. And so we think that this might be the tool that we can use to distinguish, at least in some cases, if not most, uh, natural versus synthetic wires. Well, I know that there has been uh, some controversy in the last few years over natural and synthetic uh, wire silvers in the collecting world. So I am confident that uh, as you further develop your research here, that is going to become more and more important and a much uh, a sought after tool in the collecting world. I suspect it will. Now, John, I'm going to cut to this shot here, which is a close up of the machine that's uh, behind your left ear there. Yes. Um, this is similar to the one that we saw in Chicago, albeit a much, much smaller scale. Can you tell us the difference and uh, what we can do with uh, this one that uh, is quite small and able to fit in your laboratory right there? In our laboratory, sure. And actually, if you want to um, pan or uh, cut over to the live feed, yeah, I'm going to open the door to that instrument what you were just looking at there. That was a good shot because you saw it from above. I'm going to kind of show it to you from below here. Okay. What we have is... Over on this side is the source of our x-rays. It's an x-ray okay. tube. And most x-rays, if you go to the dentist or to the doctor to have your arm x-rayed, they're using a tube source, something like this. At the synchrotron, as I'd mentioned, it's the acceleration of those electrons in the ring that produces the, um, the x-rays. What's the difference? Well, they're all x-rays, but the two main differences are the x-rays that come out of here in part because of the optics and the way this is set up, are essentially one wavelength or a very small range of wavelengths. And we desire that for the experiments we do here. 
At the synchrotron, you can think of x-rays just like visible light. And when we talk about white light, we have a continuous spectrum of all the, the wavelengths in the visible spectrum, but we have white x-rays at the synchrotron. In other words, the source emits x-rays in every wavelength throughout the x-ray spectrum. And that's a very powerful um, characteristic that allows us to do a lot of experiments that we couldn't do on this instrument because it's essentially monochromatic, whereas the synchrotron is white. The other thing is okay, the- Okay, so I'm sorry to interrupt, John. So uh, what sure. we're talking about is both um, quantity of x-rays and a fuller spectrum of x-rays by the larger synchrotron in Chicago, is that correct? So what I had mentioned so far is, is the um, spectrum, and you're right, it's a larger spectrum. The, the other thing, and you're absolutely right, Brian, the other characteristic that's really different is the quantity. And we talk about that in terms of flux or brightness, but it's just the number of X-ray photons that hit your sample. At the synchrotron, it can be as many as 10 to 15 orders of magnitude more photons, and that's moving the decimal point 15 times 15 additional zeros Jeez. in your number that's how much brighter the synchrotron is and what that buys us is the ability to analyze smaller samples lower concentrations of elements we just we can do things there we we can't do on any sort of other instrument in the world which makes them incredibly um both powerful but, but also in my opinion synchrotrons are national treasures we the science that comes out of those instruments um, helps all of humanity, not just the United States. And most major countries around the world or consortiums of countries build their own synchrotrons because of the capabilities. Fantastic. And so uh, they are all over the world, um, much grander in scale of what you have behind us. But maybe you can show us how your little uh, machine there works. Sure, I'd be happy to. And the, the, the experiment we're gonna do right now, the analysis, you can do at a synchrotron. Um, okay. Again, you can do many, many other things as well. So anyway, I'm gonna show you, that's our x-ray source. I've loaded a sample up here and the x-rays come down, they hit it and they go through a process which is known as diffraction. And then here we have a detector and that detector is gonna pick up just those diffracted x-rays and I'll show you what they look like and what we can do with those diffracted x-rays. Okay. Should I put on my lead shield uh, cape now? <laughs> the entire uh, enclosure in this thing is, is uh, shielded by lead. Okay, good. So uh, I can work um, unencumbered in this laboratory without any fear of uh, irradiation. <laughs> so I'm gonna move in on the screen here, and this is our control screen. And I'm just gonna start our measurement Right, so this will take a moment to pop up, but what we have here, we're gonna show a plot. This is intensity on this axis. Uh -huh. So the x-rays that are being diffracted is what we're measuring. And right now, I just heard the, the audible click of the x-ray shutter. So the experiment has started. And it will take just a moment before the data are starting to be um, uh, displayed. But when diffraction is not occurring, Basically, we'll get a signal down here. Okay. Here we go. Something just had a big peak that just jumped up right there. And as we go through more of this, here's the uh, data are being plotted here, very, very close to zero. Let me oh, zoom in. There's a little spike. Okay, yeah. Oh, this is, is cool. that better. Yeah. And there's another peak there. Okay. And as we go through this, we're going to see more and more peaks. And this is not a spectrum. So people who are used to seeing uh, spectral data, for example, on chemistry, this is not the same type of thing. There's another peak that just popped up. Uh -huh. This is the result of that process I mentioned called diffraction. And what this gives us is essentially a fingerprint. So when I get done with this, we'll have a series of peaks at specific values. And, and what's plotted here is angle and two theta. And that pattern is just like your fingerprint or thumbprint. It's specific to you. And this is specific to the mineral that is that I've loaded up here. And actually, Brian, this is quite amazing. I'm looking at the distribution of these peaks. Now, you have to be an expert to understand this, but I think this might be Dave Wilberite. 
I'm sorry, I'm just joking. I, I am not that much of an expert. I can't identify a face just by looking at the pattern. It could be Dave Wilbright, but that's not the I love it. <laughs> anyway. But it's got those, a Wil it has to have a Wilbur on it though. Uh, it, oh yeah, the, the sample is plenty of Wilbur's on it. It's a powder. Um, anyway, that's a fingerprint. And so this technique that we're doing here is called powder diffraction. Usually our sample is a powder or a polycrystalline sample. And we use it for identification, for fingerprinting. So I think that's a great analogy to really kind of break it down so that everyone can understand that what you're creating, what you're basically doing is fingerprinting a mineral. Exactly. Now, what if uh, you're doing some kind of conglomerate or uh, some kind of uh, uh, rock where you have multiple minerals in it? How, how does that show up on the, uh, on the display? Well, essentially, all of the, the fingerprints from all of those different minerals would be superimposed, and you'll get many, many more peaks. But one of the powerful aspects of this technique is we can deconvolute that. We can identify which peaks go with which mineral. So we, we can say, OK, yes, there's um, Dave Wilburite and um, Smectite and Quartz in our sample. Um, but we can also, by looking at the relative intensities of those peaks, identify the proportions of those minerals. So I could say it's 25% quartz and 10% whatever. And so we can quantify um, very precisely the, the amount of the different minerals present. And then you, if each mineral has a specific fingerprint, if you have a reading with uh, multiple minerals kind of lobbed on top of each other, can you remove the fingerprints of minerals that you know of looking for potentially a mineral that um, you're unsure if it's there or you're trying yeah, to- Yeah, that's a really good, that's a very good question, Brian. And, and that's the general idea behind we go through, how, what we go through for um, phase, what we call phase. So in this case, all the phases are minerals. Phase analysis in a multi-phase sample, even if we don't know what we have to start with, we start to identify some peaks going with one mineral and then we take those away. And then we keep analyzing the remaining peaks until we've identified the peaks from everything in the sample. And, and the last peak that may not be identified might be from a very, very tiny amount of a mineral in the sample. And there's only one peak from it because of the concentration. But yeah, that, that's the general idea how we do the process. Fantastic. Now, um, Dave Wilburite, in case people don't understand. It's a joke. It's kind of an homage to uh, Dave Wilbur, who's one of our uh, mineral world's uh, godfathers. Uh, and there really is no mineral called uh, Dave Wilburite. He's never had a mineral named after him. But John, what did we actually uh, see in the result there? What mineral was identified? The mineral, um, so to, to go through the process, I would run it through uh, essentially what the FBI does with fingerprints, a database and do comparisons. I happen to know what this is because I put the sample in, but if I did that, I would get a positive identification on corundum. This is a corundum sample. Corundum, okay. And then um, would you have different readings on the different type of corundums out there? Well, it turns out that, again, this is a probe of structure. It's not a spectrum oh, okay. of okay. chemistry, but minerals that have um, variable chemistry and something we may talk about in just a moment, a, a mineral that's close to my heart is appetite. And appetite's a garbage can. It, it, half the periodic table can actually go into the appetite structure. And so depending on the chemistry, the exact position of those peaks will change. And so yes, I can distinguish fluorapatite from hydroxyl appetite. I can even, in some cases, if somebody has quantified this, I might be able, or I could do it myself if I have the samples to do it. I can look at the variable shift in peaks as a function of say, strontium concentration. And so if I know that there's a complete series between calcium appetite and strontium appetite, and I have patterns from different points all the way along there, I can take an unknown then, compare it to my calibration curve and say, there's this much strontium in my sample. Interesting. John, John I have a question. What does John Rakovanite Rakova looks like? What, what, oh, what does Rakovanite look like? Rakovanite yes. is the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. It's just absolutely... <laughs> it's no a, doubt about that. <laughs> I'm, I'm really happy that uh, the mineral that I was honored with the naming of, and, and that's a very humbling experience. I, I still pinch myself, you know, 
personally, I, I still feel like the little kid who's the collector. And, and now some, somebody's named a mineral after me. I, it's, it's a very special feeling. But um, it's also quite nice that Rackovanite is a beautiful orange yellow. It's a decavanidate, and most of the decavanidates have that beautiful color. So it is a pretty mineral, although it's very, very small. I have another question for you. Maybe not everybody's familiar with how you name a mineral. So how how do we name mineral? How do you do that? How do you go through that process? Um, very good question, Eloise. And I'm going to give a little bit of a sneak preview for the end of this program. And it has to, to do with the naming of a mineral that I was involved when I was involved in. And uh, essentially, uh, if somebody discovers a mineral, it could be uh, you or um, a field collector, anybody, um, they have to get the appropriate analysis of the material to determine, is it really a new mineral? So that determines, or that includes determination of its crystal structure, its chemistry, and many of its properties, optical and physical properties. And if you can determine all of those things and show that indeed, this is new, that no other known mineral matches the structure and chemistry and, and properties, then you have a new mineral. And you or the scientist that you might be working with to, to do all of those analyses, what you do is you put in a proposal to an international body. It's the International Mineralogical Association Commission on New Minerals and Nomenclature. I may have gotten that name wrong. They've recently changed their name. But there's a commission, an international commission, that adjudicates the official naming of minerals. And so you submit all those data. And as the scientists that have collected those data, you have the opportunity to recommend what you would like to name that mineral. And today, many minerals are named in honor of individuals. The Easter egg hunt at the end of the show here is a mineral that I had the honor of naming after a colleague, very uh, um, special colleague to me, and I'm very happy that uh, we were able to do that. <laughs> I think it's Thanks, be John. I think that uh, uh, I think that uh, Tony Kempf is a bit jealous of your uh, mineral. He says that uh, Rycovanite is more attractive than Kempfite. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tony should know because Tony was uh, involved in the name or in the description and the naming of Rycovanite. <laughs> 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 Thanks, John. I will let you uh, continue the interview. All right. Now, there's not a lot of people that have uh, that are still around that have had uh, minerals named after them. I would guess maybe ten or something like that. I mean, a real, real small amount, I believe. What are you saying, Brian? Is it? <laughs> it's a great honor. I mean, you are <laughs> you are suitably uh, humbled and uh, uh, grateful for it. So, I mean, you are elder elderly proud. or. <laughs> Now, John, I know that uh, with this COVID-19 situation, a lot of universities are facing challenges right now as to whether or not they should be opening up. And so they're doing different things to make online learning a more viable and useful tool. I know that you're involved with some things there to help your students at the Miami University. Can you share with us some of the things that you've been creating? Sure, I'd be happy to. And, and yes, it, it is um, stressful what's going on. And a lot of people are doing a lot of great work to try to um, make this as smooth. A, um, I don't know if you want to call it a transition, but to make this work as much as possible. And um, one of the things, in fact, after this session is done, I'm participating in an international meeting on teaching mineralogy and petrology that starts at 2.30 uh, today. And right. people from around the world are getting together to talk about this and work together to try to help one another best pre prepare for classes. So in mineralogy, one of the things that is very commonly taught in the, in the lab is um, identifying symmetry within crystals. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I think most of us recognize, in fact, it was one of the things that turned me on to minerals from the very beginning is that's not real, is it? <laughs> oh my gosh, that's a real crystal. How could that have come out of the ground that way? One of the properties that we find in, in crystals is the symmetry within them. Now, beautiful, perfectly shaped crystals like this pyrite, we're all familiar with them, but good ones like this are actually not that common. And if you're going to look at 
crystal shapes from many different minerals, that would be a really special collection, hard to do. So traditionally, what we do in the lab is we look at wooden crystal models. And um, I was mistaken. I thought Rene Aoui was the first maker of crystal models like this. He was one of the earliest, but Eloise, can, maybe you can tell us, I, I can't pronounce the name, who is attributed to the first creation of crystal models like this wooden one? Oh my God, I'm, I'm not. I'm not a model. Um, I'm a specialist here. Um, it's. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. The guy, the 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 guy was actually making. The guy was actually making the models for uh, Aoui. Is that correct? How do you pronounce the name? I I I don't know who you are referring to. Oh, Rome de. Ah, Romy de Lille. Ah, Romy de Lille. Yes. Okay, got it. Okay. <laughs> I'm I'm sorry. You say it much much nicer than I do. Anyway, Eloise, say that again slower for us uh, non-French speakers. I'm sorry. Speakers. It's Romé de Lille. Romé de Lille. Romé de, de Lille. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. I've always You're welcome. <laughs> anyway, we create wooden models that are perfectly shaped. And, and in, at Miami, we literally have hundreds of them. And so students can work with these in person. But the problem is with COVID and getting into the laboratories, they may not be able to work in person. And so how can we reproduce these for them? I'm going to show you a program that I've been working on having developed. And I say having developed because I'm not a programmer. I did not create the program. I've been working with a gentleman named Bill Tisler who is the creator of this program, and it's called Euhedra. And there are many programs that exist for drawing crystal shapes, like the model I just showed you. The problem is for teachers is that to bring up those shapes, you have to bring up all of the data, all the information to make those things that we're asking students to find and learn about. And so what, what I needed was essentially a crystal shape viewer. And Bill created that for us with Euhedra. And I'm gonna open up, let's see here, an example. John, as you're doing that, I'm gonna ask Eloise to maybe uh, launch the poll for today. Okay. And let me see if I can find something. Let's try. I'm uh, looking for a and in, model. In the, okay. in, the, in the meantime, sorry, that the name I was looking for, you know, I, was, I didn't think that you were referring to Adelila. I thought that you were referring to the, the, the person that was actually making the model for for IV. And uh, Stefan uh, answered that question. It's um, so my so that's I won't be able to pronounce it. Svedbach de Fontaine. Okay. Exactly creating the models. So thanks, Stefan, for answering the, the question. I love the mind trust that we have here. All right. So um can you see that, Brian? Yeah, yeah, that looks great. That look is coming through very clearly. So I'm gonna spin that around. Can you guess what that's a model of? Well, I know it's not Dave Wilburite. It's not, it's not a Dave Wilburite. That's an appetite. Of course. Well, and we've got Mr. Appetite here. What else would it be? <laughs> What's interesting about this is that not only is that the right shape, but the optical characteristics that you're seeing in this model, it's transparent, it's refracting the light. That's actually based on the true refractive index of appetite. It's data based in terms of the display. So in this computer model, if you added more light sources there, you would see an accurate uh, reflection and refraction of the light as if it were in real life. Exactly. And in some cases, you can get these things. You're wondering, is this a, is this a uh, rendering or is it a real image that you're looking at? It's quite amazing. Now, yeah. what we've done here is we've modified the program or Bill has modified the program uh, for our specifications and we can open up models that look more like this. And that looks just like the wooden models that we use in the laboratory. And students then can spin this around and manipulate it in different ways to identify the symmetry as if they were holding a wooden model like this. And so we're able to do this virtually uh, as well as in person. 
Well, I, I think that's a beautiful combination of the two different worlds because there are things like, like we know with the mineral shows, uh, we could look at the best photographs and the best uh, videos of minerals in the world, but it doesn't compare to actually being at the show and being able to hold the mineral and to move it around. Same thing here, your, your students can play around with the models online, but it doesn't replace actually being there in the lab, in person, being able to handle the models. But what it does do is it extends the window uh, by which the students can experiment and become more familiar with the different uh, models there. Exactly, and my hope is we're going to get to do both. But if this coming semester we can only do the virtual, certainly in the future I'm going to be using this program along with the wooden models because these we keep in the laboratory, that they can take home with them and use any time. Well, John, I love it. I know you're a true uh, passionate uh, person about uh, teaching the next generation. And to that end, here's a fabulous book that was created by uh, your wife, Monica. And I believe uh, this was based on a true story about uh, you collecting uh, these ameth amethyst uh, uh, scepters. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about this book. And this book is... Uh, I believe it was sponsored, well, I believe, because it says right here in the back, <laughs> sponsored by the Arkenstone, but I believe you can get this on the MSA site, and we'll have that uh, URL at the end of the show. But go ahead and tell us a little bit about this book and your, uh, your experience doing that uh, field collecting. Sure, Brian. So one of the seminal experiences for me as a mineral collector was uh, started actually when I was a freshman in high school. I, I grew up in Rhode Island, and I mentioned this gentleman before, Sala Vela. Sal is a very, was a very close friend. He's passed. Um, but since the fifth grade, um, Sal was like uh, my mentor in terms of minerals and mineral collecting. And one day he called me up and said that he had been given some information about chickens. These chickens in Southern Rhode Island were finding purple rocks in the garden. And uh, we're, we, we thought, okay, we got I go check it out. So he and I drove down there. We met with the landowners, and one thing led to another. And one of the one of the premier amethyst locations in North America is Hopkinton, Rhode Island, and we were part of the discovery of that site and the excavation of it over many years. Some beautiful specimens have come out. Um, just before, I'm sorry, it was actually just after Sal's passing. My wife Monica wanted to say tell people about that story, but she was also very passionate about creating books for young children about minerals and mineral collecting and the fun and the experience of it. And so she wrote that book. There's a little bit of artistic license taken with that, of course. <laughs> I was older and, and uh, I didn't have a dog with me. But um, anyway, the book is, is pretty much based on the story of our excavation of that site and my friendship with Sal and uh, a little bit of a, a learning book. There's actually a glossary about the terms that are used in it. And so um, I'm very proud that, that she did that. And uh, like you said, it is available. You can go to the Mineralogical Society of America's website and, and they are selling it. And I believe Rob has them available also. Um, they've just done a second printing of that. Now, this is actually one of the pieces, I believe, from that locale. <clears throat> that is one of the, the, that's one of the specimens I collected very early on. That piece um, came out of the hole in 1983. And I re remember very distinctly pulling that out. Now, uh, without getting into a lot of detail, the site is um, essentially quartz veins that have collapsed and they're completely encased in clay. And so we would go in with a backhoe to get down to the level where these are found. But essentially you're, you're digging up large masses of clay and then squishing through it with your hands until you felt the crystal and you'd start to wash it off. And that's what came out one of those days of look, doing that. And I believe, uh, were you responsible for this article or contributing to this article in the mineralogical record? I am. So that later on, uh, actually, once I got into college and, and started to do mineralogical research, um, we wrote an article. We did a study on this. So originally, we thought that these were associated with granitic pegmatites. They are not. And we know that based on fluid inclusion analysis and isotope chemistry. And that's work that I did when I was... Um, a PhD student at Stony Brook, and we published the article in, about our findings in the mineralogical record. That's a specimen that uh, 
is from the location and is on display currently at the Smithsonian Institution, and that's a um, photograph of the Smithsonian's. Now, John, through work like this and books and articles like the Mineralogical Record, um, how do you feel about mineral uh, mineralogy as a course um, kind of being promoted by the universities? And is there a way to kind of bring back a renaissance for that? Or is that already in the works? Um, you know, it depends on where you are. Different places have different and, and hit, things change with time, right? So here at Miami, mineralogy is alive and strong. We have um, three faculty whose PhDs are in mineralogy. We had John Hughes when he was, before he went to um, University of Vermont was here, we had four in this one department looking in different areas of mineralogy. So I'm interested in crystal growth and um, appetite chemistry and other things. Uh, Hylian Dong is a mineralogist. He did his PhD with uh, Don Picor at the University of Michigan. He focuses on mineral microbe interactions and so how bacteria and minerals interact in nature. Mark Kreckler is here. He's a sedimentologist and industrial mineralogist. John Hughes, crystallographer, was here. So there are many different areas that we have specialties in. Um, other schools uh, don't even have mineralogists on staff, and, and other people are teaching it. So it's one of those things that you, unless you're really big, you can't cover everything. So in some places, mineralogy is very much alive. In other places, um, you know, it's it's taught, but uh, not by somebody who's a diehard mineralogist. Um, and John, we're starting to run out of time. Uh, I'm, I know that you are Mr. Appetite. I'm going to ask you if you can quickly share a couple pieces that you have there from your own collection, and then we're going to go into uh, what people have done on the poll. So uh, take it away. I'd be happy to. So I, I brought a couple specimens here. This is, um, Brian, we didn't get into a discussion of this, but in terms of what I collected for minerals now, it's very much influenced by what I do research on, and appetite's one of those things. This is a specimen of pink appetite from Chuma Bakur in um, uh, Pakistan. Wow. It's a specimen that I believe was a photograph that I had taken was, was distributed in the announcement for this talk. Um, this was a really fun thing to dig up. This summer, this is an appetite from um, Canada from one of the vein dikes up in the Grenville near Bancroft, Ontario. And um, this summer we were doing field work. One of my students, Chris and Proto, has just finished a thesis, a beautiful job, by the way, on the chemistry of appetites in vein dikes of the Grenville, the most comprehensive study so far done on, on these deposits in terms of the appetite chemistry to try to understand how they form, how the vein dikes form. But we opened up a fantastic pocket. You have a picture of it. This was the only specimen that came out of that pocket. And this was with Ray McDougall and uh, Chris and Proto, George Thompson. At the end, we had to flip a coin at who got the first pick, and I won out. So this was John. Is this the picture that I have up on my uh, monitor right now? Uh, uh, yes, yeah, that's in the dig. So that's the vein deck we are digging. And if you go to the picture of the pocket, which I think um, is the next picture. Let's see if I can find that. There's Ray and George and myself. Sorry. It's, if you can't uh, find it, no worries. That pocket yeah. had one large dinner plate size amphibole that was euhedral. I think and this is it. That's, uh, that's actually in um, Bingham, New Mexico. That's a different one. Okay, that's a different one. Yeah. Okay. And... John, you have, um, I know we're going to run a little bit over, but this is so fascinating. You have one example of a uh, lab-grown, uh, I think it was appetite on top of coral, something like that. I was totally fascinated when we were talking about this. Please share this with everybody, how important this is. Brian, this totally fascinates me as well. And one of the things that I love about the science is um, – it informs my interest and in, in passion about the collecting. This is a specimen, and I don't know if you can see the texture on it. Kind of looks like a golf ball. It looks like a golf ball, but the texture looks like a coral. And this is a coral, but it's been modified. So what, what has been done here is a natural coral specimen has been rounded into a golf ball shape. 
And then this is soaked in a solution of calcium phosphate. Now coral is calcium carbonate. And what happens is the calcium phosphate pseudomorphically replaces the calcium carbonate. And so now this is no longer calcite, it's apatite. Why would you do that? Well, it turns out what this was manufactured for is a prosthetic eyeball. If you are missing an eye and you have to use a prosthetic eye, like a glass eye, it just sits in the oral cavity or the ocular cavity and doesn't move. But because this is porous and also because it's appetite, which is a biomineral and your body recognizes it, when you use this as the prosthetic, the muscle will grow into the coral structure and your prosthetic eye will actually track with your good eye. It's just an amazing technology and it's being applied. Um, if you need a prosthetic eye, this is available to be um, uh, in place. That absolutely blows my mind. And I think you were going to actually uh, uh, show us how it works by popping your own eye out. <laughs> Let me see if I can. Oh, <laughs> stuck. I, I think the muscle has grown into that. So it's okay. These prosthetic eyes are very good. <laughs> that is incredible. Okay, um, I don't know if we have any questions, but let's jump right to um, the poll. And um, right after this, we're gonna uh, show people how they can get a free x-ray um, analysis of their minerals. So um, let's go to the poll. John, you know how this works. I'm gonna ask you 10 questions, quick fire response. I need your gut reaction. There are only gonna be two answers. And so give me your answer, okay? Yep. Number one, mountain bike or road bike? Mountain bike. Mountain bike. Number Easy. two, field work by the desert or by the sea? By the desert. By the desert. Gin and tonic or sake? Oh, two good ones, but sake trumps it. Of course. Beard or beardless? What does it look like? It <laughs> looks like a beard. <laughs> I think beard, but my wife is the one who insists on this. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, good for her. Uh, techno music or house music? House music. House music. I don't know what house music is, Brian. <laughs> what is house music? I don't know. I think they're kind of the same, but uh, I didn't make okay. these questions, so we'll just we'll just go with that. Uh, sushi or sashimi? Uh, sushi. Sushi. Mac or PC? Um, PC, absolutely. PC. Ooh, you're on the dark side. Uh, <laughs> complex structures or Japanese minerals? Uh, uh, complex structures or Japanese minerals? Oh, that's a tough one. Complex structures. Complex structures. Hotel or tent? Tent. Tent. And final, Tucson or Miami? Tucson, of course. <laughs> Tucson, okay. Eloise, do we have uh, um, the results in? Yes, we do. Uh, just for information as well, John, we have so many questions. People really loved your um, your lecture today. So I, I know that we won't have the time to actually go through all the questions. I'm sorry already before in advance. But John, I don't know if you can stay for a few minutes after if the, the, the people when, who ask the questions uh, um, can stay still stay a bit and maybe if you have a five minutes to answer all those questions that would be wonderful because so many good questions i'm sorry that uh you don't have the time to to answer them now okay go back to, going back to yes. okay uh thank you john i think uh you know we could have gone on another hour easily here but we're trying to uh be conscious of people's time uh, but if you can stay and it sounds like you can uh it's much yes. appreciated all right, Eloise, number one, mountain bike or road bike? Mountain bike. Mountain bike, okay. Number two, uh, field work, desert or by the sea? By the desert. By the desert, that's another ding. Oh, no, me. <laughs> gin and tonic or sake? Actually, people chose gin and tonic. Oh, that was a tough question. Mm -hmm. uh, beard or beardless? That was that one was easy. Beard. <laughs> Techno music or house music? Uh, house music. I don't know for the same reason that what you stated before. What is house music? Can okay. anybody define that for us, please? <laughs> <laughs> it's the music you play in your house. Apparently, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> uh, sushi or sashimi? Sushi. 
Sushi. Mac or PC? PC, yes. PC, wow. They're doing well. Yeah, they're doing extremely well. Complex structures or Japanese minerals? Complex structures. That's wow. okay. Hotel or tent? And again, right answer, tent. Wow. Tucson or Miami? And I think this is this is a no-brainer. Yeah, it's Tucson. It's Tucson. Tucson. So that is nine out of ten. Oh That's my awesome. goodness. People are winners today. Okay. Well, um, what we're gonna do is let me show you how we're gonna uh, how you're going to get a free x-ray uh, diffraction analysis and mineral identification. So first step is go to the MSA website, and that's uh, we're showing the URL on the screen. That's www.minsocam.com. Once you're there, you need to find one of the publications that they produce, and it is called uh, RIMG, or Reviews in Mineralogy and Geochemistry. And um, once you find that, you have to look for volume 48 of RIMG and note the three authors uh, for volume 48 there, three editors. Put their names in alphabetical order. And I'll give you a hint, uh, John is one of the three, so uh, that's good. Take the first author who has a mineral named after him, okay? Once you put those three names in alphabetical uh, order, take the first author, the author whose last name comes first, and name the mineral and identify the type locality for that mineral. You take those two pieces of information, first person to email that to John at uh, the email address there, which is R-A-K-O-V-A-J-F at muohio.edu you will be the winner. And I believe Eloise is uh, pasting those instructions into the chat window right now. So um, uh, do that. And the first person who gets the two correct answers to John Rackavan will win a free x-ray diffraction analysis and mineral ID. That's going to bring us to the end of our show. Uh, John, we want to thank you and thank you for hanging out a little bit uh, uh, longer. Join us next week, July 29th, where we're going to have Dr. Vera Hammer, who is a curatrix at uh, the Natural History Museum in Vienna, Austria. That's going to be one week from today. It's going to be a great interview. And also, if you happen to be around this Friday, whoops, that's not it. Uh, this <laughs> Friday, we're going to have another uh, Happy Hour Friday. And that is going to be, um, here it is. It's with uh, Christoph Keilman, who is the show promoter for the Munich Show. He's going to be joining us a little bit different time. It's going to be 12 p.m. L.A. time, 3 p.m. New York time, 9 p.m. Paris time. And he's going to uh, come and come on the show, talk a little bit about the, about the Munich Show. You will have a chance to ask him whatever questions you want. And then uh, with any other uh, leftover time, we can share mineral specimens and we can just have a, have a chat just like we did two weeks ago. A lot of fun. Please try to join us. So with that, that's the end of the official show. Uh, Eloise, I know you have a lot of great questions. So uh, why don't we um, ask John the questions that we have? And for those of you who have to sign off, thank you for tuning in. We'll see you next week or hopefully on Friday. Take care. Okay, so we have, uh, first of all, I wanted to say that um, Vera, her next... Sounds like we lost Eloise there. Uh, she was talking I'm, about. I'm sorry. Uh, yes. There she is. Okay. okay. Sorry. We're talking about Vera. Vera, Vera is here. Vera, the next guest week for next week is here. So thanks, Vera, for joining. We are looking forward to seeing you next week. Uh, I know that you were mentioning uh, John Hughes as well. So John Hughes was uh, was with us uh, today. So that's uh, that's really great. For the list of questions, oh my God, we have 22 just on the Q and A. Oh God. Um, and we had a lot on the chat on the chat coming, and a lot of them considered were were about the. Um, silver the silver wires so if i go all the way back to the beginning maybe i don't know john can you open the the q a from your uh computer maybe that would be easier for you to see and sure. uh you to answer that would be maybe the the easiest thing to do 
So that's in the chat. Yes, that's no, it's in the Q and A. Sorry, so on the bottom you have oh, participants. Yes. Alrighty. And so uh, I'm gonna. Um, I have to change my computer screen here, so I don't. We can. I can just tell them. I can just ask them. Okay. Ask Why don't them. you just read off a couple for John uh, Eloise? So uh, a lot on the wire. Um, Alicia was curious about the application you foresee for those wire crystals. So the, the wires themselves, I don't know, we haven't thought of an application necessarily, but from a technological standpoint, um, the phenomenon that we see with the isotopes, it turns out that the silver isotopes are fractionated. That means that there's two isotopes, 109 and 107 of silver, and the, the ratio of those change from their natural ratio when the wires grow. And that process enriches, in this case, the 109. It turns out that that is unexpected. All of the known mechanisms for isotope enrichment or fractionation in nature would predict just the opposite, that the 107 would be enriched. And so we think we may have discovered a new naturally occurring mechanism for isotope fractionation. And if that's the case, that's very important. It's important both to science and technology in terms of being able to physically enrich uh, isotopes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Douglas was interested in how you got interested in appetite in the first place. Well, uh, I hope that Raquel is still on the on the uh, audience here because it has to do with Harvard University. Um, when I started at, I see you, Raquel. <laughs> <laughs> I started at um, at Stony Brook for my PhD. I worked with uh, a professor, Richard Reeder, and one of his graduate students, Jam Paquette. She's a professor now at McGill University. They were looking at a new phenomenon she had discovered called intrasectoral zoning. And it had to do with crystal growth and trace elements and color and all these things that I was interested in. And I thought, oh, I want to work on that. That's fantastic. But they're already working on calcite. They, they, Rich is a carbonate mineralogist. And so I had to come up with something else to work on and wasn't sure what. So I went to Harvard and I, Carl Francis was the curator at the time, and I said, I would like to look through the collection for certain minerals with certain characteristics that I could potentially use for this study. I look for quartz and Vesuvianite and uh, zoocyte and apatite. And then I took them back to the lab and I characterized them and looked for which one showed this phenomenon. And the first one to show it was apatite. And that's what got me hooked. Okay, thank you. Instrumental um, both in my career in terms of what I've pursued, but also in what I identified for my PhD. Cool, very cool. Museums um, are absolutely critical. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, we'll send you your paycheck uh, later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, back to the wires. Um, so that was uh, earlier on, and um, Jennifer Camp was asking, if your hypothesis is correct, would you be able to grow gold? Uh, well, if our hypothesis of how gold grows is correct, then I think we will. So we'll find out. Either, either technologically we won't be able to do it or our hypothesis is wrong, but we, we think we know how to. We're going to try it. Okay. I can't wait to get Terry Wallace on the show. Maybe we'll bring you <laughs> back and you guys can chat gold. And I guarantee that's going to be a fantastic conversation to just be a force. Terry knows so much more about gold than I do. I don't know if I can chat very long. <laughs> John? We have a question here from the audience. Okay. John, do you mean by solid state ion conduction? Uh, we believe that it is also occurring by that process, yes. Okay, next question by Peter uh, Tarasov, uh, who's a metallurgist, sorry for my like bad accent. Uh, so he had a question if the screw dislocations had a role in the growth of the wires. I don't know if it was about the wire, the, the gold or the silver though. Uh, so in general, they, they, they probably exist in those things, but um, the growth mechanism is very different than what, classic, what we think of in classical crystal growth, either from a melt or from a solution where atoms are coming down and attaching to a surface and things like dislocations create the right topography on the surface for continued growth. Because, dis, because the growth mechanism is so different in terms of the environment, 
even though dislocations may be there, I don't think that they are a significant component to the growth mechanism. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question by Chris Stefano um, was about the, the striations that we could see on the wires. What is the source of them? So essentially, see if I can find a pen here quickly. Unfortunately, we've cleaned everything up because we want everything to be clean and I don't have a pen. If you can picture this, the wires are actually growing from a canthite. The silver that is being added to the wire is not coming from the environment. It's coming through the acanthite and being added to the bottom of the wire where the wire attaches to the acanthite. Wow. The footprint, the rough shape of whatever your, your air zone of wire growth is, if you just keep translating that, that footprint leads to the striations on the silver. Okay, and the people were seeing the bright spots uh, on the on the wire crystals. Uh, I guess that's just dust, right? It's not. It's not. Is it really the silver, or is it? Uh, you had like some little specks on the on the yeah, SCM. Yeah, could be. Actually, if you can zoom out, Brian, um, what I want to find here is okay. So I'm looking at the data. That, that's a secondary electron image, which means that the brightness is not a, a function of. Um, Atomic mean, mean atomic weight. So that's just a surface feature. I think it's dust. And so another question related to the grain, the silver grains. Our um, question was about the orientation. Do they have a random orientation, or are they oriented like uh, graphically? So we've looked at a number of samples. Um, there's a much more thorough study on the um, internal texture of these things by a technique called EBSD, and that was done by Thomas Bollinghouse and others at, in Germany. Um, I'd have to refer back to their paper to look at exactly their findings, but in general, you don't have a very strong preferred orientation. There might be a small preferred orientation, but for the most part, it's relatively random. Okay. And um, what was the diameter of the silver wire that you produced in the lab? Ah, diameter, that's a good question. Um, I don't know like who grew them all would have measured those. I don't know offhand, but they were very thin diameters. We didn't produce anything um, that really approaches what we know of as natural wires, although they're quite variable. From Kongsberg, Norway, there are wires that are the diameter of my forearm, and we didn't get anywhere close to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's crazy. <laughs> um, another question from John as well, and I think we were um, looking at the um, X-ray, uh, and he was asking what was the minimum concentration that could be detected by X-ray crystallography. I think it was um, it was when you were doing the um, um, the powder analysis. Okay, so remember what we're getting here is not the concentration of elements; it's the concentration of a mineral in a aggregate of minerals. So what would be the minimum detection limit for a phase in a polycrystalline phase or poly uh, mineral phase? It, it, a, a good rule of thumb is between one and five volume percent. Okay. okay. And still related to the um, X-ray, um, George Adelman was asking if the, the tested powder, it, it has to be a tested powder or if it could be a solid sample. Uh, In this so specific that, that's a really good question. And it's one that students often confuse because, I mean, a powder is, is not aggregated, right? When we talk about a powder from, powder from a crystallographic standpoint, we're saying polycrystalline. So you, absolutely, you can put a solid sample in there, and if it's polycrystalline, you're going to get the same type of data. In fact, we commonly put thin sections in the diffractometer. Mm -hmm. um, a next question to uh, about appetite by Cindy Yablock. Uh, does the mineral signature or, or fingerprint of appetite remain very constant with single within a single locality? Um, so if you're talking about the, um, the structural fingerprint, in other words, the x-ray diffraction pattern, it depends on the locality. There certainly are examples where there's variability, but in most localities, yes, the appetite will have a, a very, at one locality, will, will be within a range of chemistries, and so its fingerprint pretty much looks the same. Mm -hmm. 
but there, there, are, there certainly is variability. Okay. Uh, Matthew Metzler is asking, can silver potentially influence the formation of copper wires in addition to potentially influencing the formation of gold wires? Um, yes, I, we believe it does. Uh, as I had mentioned, we hypothesize that um, the presence of silver is necessary for the formation of wire gold. We actually have about seven or eight data points now, and every data point we have, in other words, we've analyzed natural gold wires, every one that we've analyzed has at least 25% silver in it. Hmm. Okay. In the context of copper wires, now this gets into something we can't discuss here, but maybe at Tucson, um, okay. I have never mm -hmm. seen what I would consider a true copper wire. Okay. And that has to do with how I define a wire. Some people might define it differently. And wait, uh, okay. share your Let's definition, if you would. The presence of these striations is, is one of the key features. You can have a single crystal that's extremely elongate, um, but oftentimes with the copper wires, you can see that they're faceted. Uh-huh. Gotcha. John, you that's remember we also, sorry, Eloise, we also saw like twin crystals that they end up being like a wire. They So the crystallography of the, of the crystals is going to, in appearance, is going to change. Absolutely. So uh, very commonly in the native, in metals like gold and copper, and even in silver, um, you can get spinel twins and the twinning, the effect of a twin is that oftentimes it will grow preferentially in one or two directions. And so that's one of the reasons why you get the elongate morphology is because it's twin and it prefers to grow that way. So oftentimes what looks like a wire is actually a very elongate spinel twin. Uh, next question by Bruce Karen Cross is your crystal, uh, the UEDRA crystal program, is it freely available? Or is it, it? It is freely available. It will be um, put out. Hopefully, we're, we're going to decide this today at this next meeting. Um, but I'm going to serve it through the Mineralogical Society of America webpage. They have a new site now. If you go to the front page on teaching mineralogy, and uh, we're going to distribute it to the MSA. So yes, it is. It is free to the community. Okay. So that's good to know. Um, next question. Can you model in perfectly formed crystals that are skewed in development and have different faces on different sides? Yes. Okay. Uh, George Adelman, uh, what other mineral identification instruments do you have? Uh, here at Miami, we have, um, well, the, character, the defining characteristics of a mineral are its crystal structure and its chemistry. We have diffraction of different types, both the um, powder diffraction and single crystal diffraction, which we use for structure analysis. Uh, we have scanning electron microscopy with EDS for chemistry. We have handheld EDS. Um, we have transmission electron microscopy with EDS. We have Raman spectroscopy. Uh, we have a lot of techniques available to us here. That's cool. That's a proper lab. Nice. <laughs> <Jealous>. uh, <laughs> um, David Straw is asking, do you do any other metals form wires? I guess copper is out of the question, but any other metals? Well, certainly gold does. And, and the Harvard gold is, is a spectacular example of that. Um, it's possible that copper does. And again, uh, Bob Cook and I have discussed this, and it depends on how you define a wire. Uh, he that the, the morphologic single crystal wires are wires, and, and so it just depends on your perspective. I use silver as kind of the defining, the, 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 I'm comparing everything to what we've understood from silver, and copper wires are very different than silver wires. Um, there was a specimen that sold recently, and I know the gentleman who purchased it, there were beautiful examples of highly striated platinum wires. Hmm. Growing off of a, a cubic platinum crystal. Okay, okay. So same kind of related to a question by John uh, White. I'm sorry if I don't pronounce your last name correctly. When you grow the wires, can you add several types of metal atoms to the growing process? Yes, and we have done that. Okay. Wow. And uh, side questions. Uh, there is a subset mineral for Tucson twenty.
2021 Appetite Series Minerals. Will you talk about it? Will you be one of the speaker? Will you do something for, for the Tucson show? Yes, to all of the above. <laughs> okay. And uh, one question I, I'm pretty sure that you can't really, um, really fully fulfill. Um, can you show your appetite fluorescing? Unfortunately, I can't right now, but I can show yeah. you one other kind of cool thing if you'd like. Sure. You know, we still have over okay. 100 people uh, on the show, so okay. I'm sure that. Uh... <laughs> so what I have here is a Geiger counter. It's an okay. electric and you may, most people are probably familiar with these uh, deep blue appetites from um, Ipira in um, uh, Brazil. Mm -hmm. Can you hear that? Yeah. Yes. Okay. They're slightly radioactive because there's a lot of uranium and particularly thorium in these. In fact, that uranium and thorium is both in the crystal structure of the appetite and its inclusions that probably formed due to exolution of some of that uranium and thorium into the structure or from the structure. Uh, so these are slightly radioactive. Don't have to worry about it in terms of jewelry. We've, we've looked at the dosages and it's not an issue, but the fact that these are radioactive is very important because that is a um, indication that we could use appetite for dating. And anybody who in the audience is a geologist knows that it's one of the very common geochronometers. We use it we look for appetite in rocks because we can date them due to radioactive decay of things like the uranium and thorium. Okay, so we understand that appetite is the best mineral ever. Yeah, of course. Okay, <laughs> okay well, thanks, John. I think that was all the questions in the, in the q and I think. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Eloise. John, thank you again Well, I guess it's time for closing. I'm sorry. What was that, Eloise? I cut you off there. Oh, no, it was just, um, I'm, I was just saying thank you and goodbye, <laughs> pretty <Okay>. much. <laughs> All right. So, John, thank you again for the interview and uh, uh, extra special thank you for hanging out a little bit longer, about uh, 20 minutes and answering all the questions that our viewers had for you. All right. I'm going to run up to my next meeting, but thank you all for uh, having me. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.